in 1914 and never succeeded. So now that I've posited this calendar, the question is where should commemoration take place? And here I would like to make the case that there are three general sites of memory <clears throat> at which we can measure ourselves and our world against the monstrous character of the Great War. The first is at the war memorials which are scattered throughout the world. The second is the battlefield cemeteries and sites, some preserved, others still marked by the detritus of war. The third is war museums, <clears throat> which now exist all over the world. The place to start is not the national war memorials, <coughs> excuse me, but the local memorials, the local monuments to the dead of the Great War. <clears throat> the further away we go from capital cities, the closer we are to the small groups of men and women who did the work of remembrance during the war and in its aftermath. These were the sites of mourning for those who could not go to the battlefields, who could not go to the national capitals. Here is an eclectic set of images of them. My intention is to show the varieties of messages of all kinds that they represented. Relatively few of the war memorials that I've seen are triumphalist. There are some, but they're relatively few. The bloodbath made that provost difficult for the families of the dead to take, and these were created for the families. War memorials were places where women entered the narrative of war, where they came to do the work of mourning. Have a look at these. The first is in the village of Anian in the Ardèche in the south of France. Peasant families lost their sons. Peasant families are sculpted on the local memorial. The same is true <coughs> for the village of Bouilly, Les Mines, and the Pas de Calais, a mining and textile region. Here, grandparents leave an orphan to the local war memorial to see the name of his father, because the name is all that remains. What we should understand that the First World War inaugurated is that war was not only a killing machine, but a vanishing act. 50% of the men who died in the First World War have no known graves. 50% of the men who died vanished. That is exactly the same percentage of those who died in the attacks on 9-11. 50% vanished without trace. The First World War opened the century, if you will, that reached uh, the World Trade Center on the 9th, uh, on the 11th of September 2001. This is another image of the same war memorial showing you how important the names are. And the cult of names, the cult of naming, falls directly upon the disappearance of the bodies. This is clearly the preparation for the uh, extraordinary search for names that followed the Holocaust and went all the way to Buenos Aires and the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo. The, the cult of names is the cult of warfare in which war is not just a killing machine, but a vanishing. <laughs> this is a, a memorial um, of a different kind. This is from the Ariège, the center of France, and shows a much broader range of emotion, fear, horror, astonishment. This is an interesting one because it was done by a former soldier himself. More unusual is this plaque on the war, on the war memorial in Show you see in the mountain. It pro provides cameos of the faces of the men who died. Once again, the intimate, direct, familial quality of the commemorative site is striking. In the British Isles and the Dominions, the tendency was to use somber, meditative, reflective statues to represent the solemnity of loss of life in war. There are triumphalist images here and there, but most are like this one. One I should have put in from this, the village of Enniskillen in Northern Ireland. The reason why I should have put it in, and I forgot and I apologize, is that the sign was pointed. It was the target of a murderous IRA bomb attack in 1987, killing 11 and wounding 63. Now, many of the British uh, groups on the local level decided to choose an obelisk. Why? Because they had a reformation to get rid of the cross, as, as it were, as a site of idolatry. Obelisks also had a great advantage of being the cheapest form of statue. Uh, and it's not at the local level, because the local level is the place where people pay for these. States didn't pay for them, ordinary people did. Now, in Australia, war memorials are similarly laconic, restrained. 
They have the distinction of listing all men who served, thus pointing out by omission those local residents who didn't serve. War memorials, therefore, were chastisements. Now, this brings us to the second site of the pilgrimage, uh, of pilgrimage appropriate to the centennial commemoration. And there will be many commemorations at the second site. Tens of millions of people will make the journey from around the world to war cemeteries and to the battlefields surrounding them. This, too, is a re reiteration of the journeys made in the 20s and 30s of those who lost sons or fathers and who could afford the fare. But we're luckier. In real terms, travel is seven times cheaper today than it was in 1925. Huge crowds will come to these sites on specific days. For Australians, it is Anzac Day. For the British and Irish, it is the 1st of July. The same day is sacred to Newfoundlanders, then colonials, now Canadians, who mark uh, the 1st of July uh, because of their courage and sacrifice at Bowman Hamill. Now, I choose to discuss a couple of these because of their unusual character. The first point to notice is that this is not the Latin cross. This is a medieval cross of chivalry. And one of the extraordinary features of British, that is to say, more generally, uh, imperial and now commonwealth war graves uh, cemeteries, is their ecumenical character. These are cemeteries of the non-Christian kind. Yes, there are crosses among the cellar, but at the same time, the iconography and the horticulture is not restricted to Christian notation at all, which annoyed, extraordinarily annoyed, <coughs> many Christian prelates at the time. And so this is a medieval cross of chivalry uh, in one of the Commonwealth War Graves Commissions in France. This is what they look like. English country gardens, in which the, as it were, the heart of the war is expressed in, in the beauty of as peaceful a kingdom as one could find uh, for the men who died in that war. This is a German First World War cemetery. They're on balance much smaller uh, than the English or the French, or, the, uh, or rather the Commonwealth, First Imperial, now Commonwealth War Graves Commission in the French, for obvious reasons. The French were loath to give large tracts of land to the people who had been thrown out uh, after four years of occupying their territory. So most of them have common graves, that hill in the back is a common grave rather than the graves that are particularly associated with one individual. We know about the cenotaph, and again, think of the ecumenical character here. The cenotaph is a pre-Christian symbol. It's a Greek symbol. It's a symbol before. It's not the symbol of the empty uh, tomb of Christ. It's a symbol before Christianity. And the Dean Inge, the Dean of uh, the Westminster, was absolutely furious that there was no cross uh, on the cenotaph. When it was first done on the 19th of July, 1919, five days after Bastille Day, it was done by Edmund Lutyens and, and Plaster of Paris because they had to put up something for the victory parade, which first happened in Paris and then in London. But the British people as a whole voted with their feet for this is the National War Memorial. Two million people came and deposited wherever they could. They left small objects, symbolic exchange, that had given everything, they at least could give something. And as a result of it, the British cabinet asked not just to turn it into the permanent memorial where it is today uh, on Whitehall. But it wasn't Christian. It was for all of those. 500,000 Muslim troops fought for the British Empire. There were Hindus, there were Jews, there were people with no religion at all. And hence the, uh, as it were, statuary of commemoration, where pilgrimage will happen, motions as it were, points us towards what I would call globalized mourning, where the terms are no longer national. They are transnational. And Lutyens, the architect uh, of genius, who had created New Delhi, the architect of empire, is the man who saw it. Now, this is a, a war memorial that I'm going to certainly uh, go to uh, each year uh, of the Great War. On the 10th of October, I'll tell you why. On that day, the uh, the son of these two people, the woman in granite bending over, is the sculptress artist Katie Colvitz, uh, and her husband Carl is as were, engaged in, in massive gendered emotion, you know, a man holding his emotions in, the woman bent over in, in resignation, on their knees, asking for forgiveness from their son, 
and all the other young people who had no chance to have a life. We didn't have the good fortune of living at a time where they could die one at a time and die all together. Uh, their son, Peter, tried to persuade them at the beginning of the war that joining up as a volunteer in the German army was just and right in defending, in defending his country. They were uh, against the idea, but felt that his honor, his sense of honor, had to be respected. They regretted that for the rest of their lives, and it took Katie Colvis 18 years to design this particular war memorial. And I've been there in many seasons, and I don't know if others of you know this too, but this part of Flanders is a period, is a place where it almost always rains. And I have no idea whether Katie Colvis knew about this. But the statue always cries every time I've been there. Uh, she created it in such a way, over 18 years, it was extremely difficult for her to design it in such a way that it created a sign which made commemoration, in my view, uh, an extraordinary uh, sight. And it is there, and in those circumstances, that I believe that we need to understand what commemoration does. This is, by the way, another one of her, this work, her, her style of, of sloping a woman's uh, body to describe uh, the uh, resignation of the mother of the children. This is in the Neue Wache in uh, Berlin. It's a national, uh, it's a national monument. Uh, there's a story behind it. This statue is never that size. But the German chancellor, on the cold, decided he needed one to symbolize those who died fighting uh, the Nazis and the communists. And so he appropriated it and ballooned it uh, in a form that still exists to this day. The family wasn't asked. That's not the way German chancellors operate. Uh, the, the shape of the body is what I'm interested in. Well, the, the last one that I want to talk to you about goes back to the collections. And this is perhaps a visual expression of the point of my lecture. The visual expression is just simply this, that um, here's a man who was the architect of the empire. And here is the art of Chernobyl. But look what he did. There are two things that he did. My eyesight is particularly bad. My student's eyesight is much better. But if you notice, there are white facades uh, on the trunk of those small, as uh, were well, relatively small, uh, arches. At a certain vanishing point, all of a sudden, the names appear. This is the monument to the missing on the song, the monument to those who have no graves, 73,000 of them, for just the battle of the song. Now, the important point there is that it is a reenactment of the tragedy of war. Because as you walk towards it, the names suddenly appear. It's as if the disappearing act of, of war can be reversed through the cult of names. But not only the cult of names. So I can do this. Yes, I can. If you notice, each of this arch, there are four of them at the base. And what Lushes did in his design was to turn this arch around, and make it two and a half times larger on the side that we can't see. And then do it again and make the arch two and a half times larger at the sun you can see. And each time the arch is made two and a half times larger, the empty space in the middle is multiplied as well. Until, what is it at the top? What do we see on the top? We see triumph reduced to nothing. This is an extraordinary site, which was the symbol, the model, and a turning point in the representational arts. This was the inspiration for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington that Maya Lin uh, designed and became the fundamental representation uh, of the loss of life uh, in war. Um, and the reason is its simplicity. The extraordinary feature of First World War commemoration is its simplicity in that the distinction between celebration and commemoration is simple. It simply takes a certain form of courage to maintain it. Now the third places that I want to draw your attention to, very briefly, in conclusion, are war museums. So aside from war memorials and battlefields, there are places to go to now. And this is actually a, a, a cartoon that I can't resist showing you. I found it in Auckland, New Zealand, where they had a war memorial museum. And they did it in the 
early on, uh, this is 1921, uh, and asked various people to design it, privileging veterans. And the question was, what constitutes a war museum? Now you'll see that the, uh, uh, the title of it is a museum memorial, museum memorial. We don't know which it is, this idea of how do you balance the notion of a museum, which can be celebratory. Guns and weapons can be, and how do you make a memorial? Very difficult. Here you see a disappointed architect named Sousa. Here's a statue of a prominent citizen who would give money for the thing, and therefore they would change his name every week. Here is uh, the, the mixture, as it were, of the museum and memorial. Bugs and beetles are an entrance. Come to see these wild animals. And the one that I find most poignant is here is a returning soldier who fruitlessly is searching for the war. He can't see it in the museum uh, structure. Now, this uh, suggested design for the memorial by an infant prodigy says everything there is about the problem of war museums. What are they there for? And there is the reason why uh, I'm going to close with this set of images today. War museums are, in many respects, very important uh, in our national culture. They were intended to be tributes to the men and women who endured the tests of war. They have very little room for recording the history of anti-war movements. And their presentation of weapons and battlefield scenes, some though not all, tend to sanitize war. Now, this is, these are the guns many of you have seen, naval guns, outside of the Imperial War Museum in Lambeth, in London. And, and the point is, the Imperial War Museum is a very important site of memory, extremely important. And uh, the question of balance between commemoration and celebration is one that is being negotiated now, it's being redesigned. And it's being redesigned, I think, uh, validly. Here's a second uh, war memorial museum, which has enormous power. This is the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. And it is, you may be able to capture this very easily, this dome is deliberately shaped in the model of Hagia Sophia uh, in uh, Constantinople and Istanbul to bring back the notion of the greatness of the creation of the nation on the shores of Philippi. Now, going back to the Imperial War Museum, this is part of it that I personally can't stand. It's called the Trench Experience. And it's a way of representing the war uh, in uh, a form I call pseudo-realism, where there are plastic rats and there's all kinds of dust. And these are, needless to say, plastic characters, as if we need to somehow turn uh, the uh, memory of war into an adventure story, perhaps even worse than that. Uh, this, by the way, has been repeated in a museum at, at Moe on the, on the River Marne. Uh, this is a marquette of a trench, a model of a trench, as if, you know, creating it in its own, uh, 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 in its own way requires all, sign, all kinds of, uh, of false uh, moments of reiterated uh, artifice. Now, this museum is one that I personally helped put together. It's called Historia of La Gronia. And we deliberately made it look different. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of concrete and everything is underground. The second point about it is that the horizontal axis is the key element of the organization of space. On the grounds that the vertical axis is the axis of hope and celebration, and the horizontal axis is the axis of commemoration and mourning. The same thing can be said about the use of weapons. I particularly like this trilogy in room three of our museum. Uh, it's, it's, it's basically a, a, a syllogism. Uh, attack, defense, surgery. And in the surgery, in the surgery, we have some of the items uh, that kept to the French writer Je ne vois saint engaged in writing about the first world war. Well, in the conclusion, of that museum. We try to raise a question that I'd like to leave you with today. My central point is this. I believe that these sites of memory, museums, war memorials, battlefields, cemeteries, are the cathedrals of the 21st century. They're places where sacred questions are posed and occasionally answered. Eternal questions about sacrifice, death, love, betrayal, loyalty, devotion, suffering. In 
many parts of the world, many more people go to museums than go to churches. On a Sunday a few weeks ago, I passed Trinity Anglican Church in Lambeth just after having visited the nearby Imperial War Museum in London across the street, was struck by the enormous contrast. While secularization has taken its toll on our churches, the sacred has not vanished from our field of vision. The sacred has simply moved out of the churches and inhabits other places. Those places are where we should commemorate the Great War. Museums, cemeteries, battlefields, archives, monuments. Perhaps we can understand more of the force of the song I played for you right at the opening of my remarks, sung by the cathedral choir of Salisbury Cathedral. And like a cathedral choir, <clears throat> these voices, which we can hear and feel, proclaim not the innocence, but the humanity of the men who died in 1914-18. We cannot ignore the fact that soldiers were executioners as well as victims. They joined up because they believed their cause was just. And though many words may be appropriately attached to them, innocence is not one of them. It's an interesting contrast to the poetry of the period before the war. They didn't get the war they asked for. They fought the war that was given them. The story we hear about the war in the song I played and many others is about the sheer waste, the stupidity, the inhumanity of that war we call great. It was the greatest calamity ever seen, a calamity which opened the door to even greater disasters. How then must we answer the question I said at the outset of my remarks? How should we remember the great war a hundred years after? Through meditation, through pilgrimage to local war memorials, to national ones, to war museums and war cemeteries, and to the battlefields in which they are unfolded. Pilgrimage is hard. Tourism is easy. Take the hard way and reflect on the fate of millions of men who did not have the privilege we do of dying one at a time. Stand where they stood. Read the inscriptions on their gravestones. Read the names, because in most cases, that's all that is left of them. Your name shall live forevermore, says Ecclesiasticus. That was the phrase chosen by Kipling to mark every single Commonwealth War Graves Cemetery. He knew of what he spoke. His son vanished during the Battle of Luce in 1915, and his body has never been found. His name is all that remains. In making these journeys of remembrance, I believe we are engaged in a political act. I believe that the current memory boom arising from the two world wars has been a powerful catalyst for the progressive delegitimation of war in our times. Let me put a daring proposition to you. I'm sure not everyone will agree with me, but I want to put it to you anyway. Should it be surprising that Tony Blair and George Bush lied about weapons of mass destruction in order to pass legislation enabling them to go to war in Iraq? They had to lie, since without such an alarming cause, it is no longer politically possible for nations to go to war with the support of the people. Popular opinion on both sides of the Atlantic won't have it, as Iraq demonstrated a decade ago, and the Syrian crisis today demonstrates quite emphatically. Since the 1980s, after the Falklands War, war has lost much of its glory, its honor, its popular and political appeal, though computer games show that simulated war still has its attractions. Commemorating the Great War, then, is, in my view, a moment to honor those who died in war. As part of a commitment to render such moments of slaughter not only illegal, but unthinkable, visit these sites in the next five years or so, choose your dates, and vote with your feet. What better act of commemoration can there be? Thank you. Teaching uh, the Great War 
uh, is to recognize it as uh, linked in fundamental ways to the second world. Uh, the, the, uh, the way that I've taught it for 40 years um, is as intimately related to a form of uh, collective suicide that European societies went through between 1914 and 45. The world that exists after the Second World War is a world that's conscious, a conscious rejection of that which create, was created in 1914 and played out until 1945. So perhaps one way to do it is through the Second Thirty Years War of the 20th century and to bring to students who know more about the Second World War. This is, this is true in many parts of the world, but the Second World War is immediate and accessible. And one way to teach the First World War is to say we've got to enlarge the Second World War because without the First World War, it never would have happened. But there was a child in the First World War. He couldn't conceivably have gone anywhere without it. Lenin would never have been uh, uh, anyone other than a mad uh, Russian revolutionary without the First World War. We can see a whole range of linkages that I think uh, enable us to break, as it were, the, the screen memory, for I would call it, of the Second World War. You, you include the first by the second. Mind you, the best way to teach it is to accept the fact that the Second World War is in people's families' histories and in the narratives that we all break, uh, but that it wasn't, as it were, a, uh, a conflict that came out of the blue sky. It was created by the First World War, and uh, again, this is controversial by the catastrophic peace that we did, uh, which is something I do not commemorate. Uh, there are other days that we need, as I said, the Fourth of May is is much better in date than the 28th of June, 1919, to commemorate the other world. Um, early in the war, after the German army had passed through Belgium and uh, into France, they turned south instead of advancing toward uh, Paris, thus setting up uh, four years of trench warfare. Why do you think they turned that way? Uh, I think that the German army uh, turned to the east of Paris rather than to the west of Paris because the, the idea, the original plan was impossible. Uh, in other words, the Schlieffen plan, which by the way, everybody knew, everybody knew the Schlieffen plan. They had practiced it, they were all at each other's war games. Everyone knew what it was. Uh, but the Allied, later the Allied troops and generals, believed that the Germans wouldn't be crazy enough to try. Uh, and the reason is that it pushed the German army, which was extraordinary, but it pushed the German army to the limits of human endurance. 42 days, 42 days. And, you know, it's a German army, it's not 43 days, it's 42 days. There's going to be, uh, as it were, an enormous move of one million German troops from uh, uh, Aachen, near Cologne, where they were all staged, through Belgium, all the way through Belgium, and then an enormous arch in which, as Street had said, the sleep of the last German soldier uh, on the right flank would brush the English Channel, and then sweep up behind Paris and destroy the French to the west and south of Paris, that was what they were aiming So what happened was, this unbelievably, as it were, densely populated region presented obstacles. The first was the fort of Liège that could destroy it without using their very heavy guns. They did it. It took longer than they thought. Then they believed there was civilian obstruction, which was not true. It came from the memory of 1870, where there was civilian obstruction. And the men who were junior soldiers in 1870 were senior commanders and said, shoot the line. Any civilian who shoots without a uniform uh, must be shot, and they shot 6,000 uh, innocent uh, Belgians on the basis of uh, a false memory. So when they moved into France, the purpose of the British Expeditionary Force, 100,000, was to take a bloody nose and literally get destroyed in order to make, slow them down. By the time they got north of Paris, there were two uh, branches of the right wing of the German army which got separated. Now that's very easy uh, to, to understand in terms of the confusion of war and the chaos of it. <clears throat> the German army's headquarters were in Luxembourg and they depended upon tele telegraphy. That was the stupidest thing to do. <clears throat> because what are soldiers going to do at the end of the day when they've been marching with a 60 pound pack on their back under fire in the heat of the summer in, in this intensely uh, populated area, what are they going to do? They're going to sit down and make dinner. And what are they going to use as firewood? The telegraph poles. <laughs> it's, 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 it's perfectly normal to understand how the concept of control of battle, that you can understand what's going on and you can command it, 
is simply insane. So when they got to the north, as it were, to this point where there was a split, they suddenly said, we've got to send somebody down there. And he was a man nobody knows anything about. It's called Lieutenant Colonel Hench. And Lieutenant Colonel Hench got to the point and saw that there was close to a mile divide between the two branches of the right uh, wing of the German invasion. And anybody who has the slightest understanding of military strategy will realize that's, that's dangerous. It's dangerous because of the flanking movement divided the two and destroy them. So what he did, he ordered the right flank to move towards the left. And that means moving to the east of Paris on the Marne and not to the west. So the, my answer to you is that the German army did it because the plan was completely impossible in the first place. And that as soon as it became clear that it was impossible, the commander, von Moltke, whose uncle was the victor of, of 1870, the commander had a nervous breakdown, realized it was all over. And from that moment on, the German army, through its genius of what they call the operatif, which is a way of turning orders into boots on the ground, were able to create a defensive as a structure to cover their initial defeat. And because of their genius, they were able to wear down the French army and the British army and the Australians and the Canadians and everybody else for four years. They just couldn't do it forever. Uh, and in 1914, I, I think the war was lost right then and there. And the reason was, it was a war the best form of which to play is not to play it at all. It was, it was lost when we were I'll go even further than that. The, the moment that, that, uh, that the, the Schlieffen plan started by invading Belgium, the Germans lost the war because they knew, they knew from diplomatic exchanges that the British would not accept the French defeat because that would put the German Navy on the English Channel. The control of the English Channel is the control of British imports. 75% of the British food came from abroad. So the, the British would not accept German control of the English Channel. So when they invaded Belgium, it was to get that control. And at that moment, Britain declared war and turned it into a war for the control of Northwestern Europe. It was not for a scrap of paper, the way Beth and Holbeck said. It was for a real conflict, for a real issue. And ultimately, that uh, control of Northwestern Europe uh, was what was uh, finally decided in 1945. So I think the German army lost the war on the very first day of its, uh, its, uh, its break. I just have a question on uh, how memories passed on from generation to generation. Because the Great War is 100 years ago now. And I'm intrigued in my travels. I mean, in some parts of the world, we see young people showing up. For example, here we have Remembrance Day. I'm always struck by the number of young people, people of all generations. In some countries, they've been able to take the experience of the Great War and translate it down to the generations to say, we're not glorifying war by the cause. We're remembering these, these people. But yet in other countries, other cultures, a young person wouldn't be caught anywhere near a war memorial. That's right. it's, it's something that's in the distant past. It's something that you don't go to. It's suspicious because you're seen as glorifying war or the cause. And especially in countries that were defeated, where the cause is Nowhere, nowhere near being noble. Or, or the portrayal of the history of the war is so national that even the neighbors can't come up with a common history of that war. It's still seen as national device. If you have anything to say about kind of how, this, how memories are passed down to the younger generation, how young people can be brought into the kinds of commemoration that you're talking about in a way that's inclusive and not nationalistic or political or Device. Well, it's an important question. It's one to which the initial question, how do you commemorate those who die in war without or glorify or honor those who die in war without glorifying war? So that's the, it, that is the question. That seems to be the essential question of this, of this commemorative season. And the, the answer is twofold. The first is the, uh, the growth in the number of young people who are, who are attending commemorative sites from all over the world uh, is partly a growth of what I call pacifism. And by that I don't mean a doctrinaire rejection of war, but a rejection of a war like 1914-18. That's the key issue. To be pacifist, in my sense of the term, is not to be on principle against war, just to be against that slaughter. And the reason why you have to say that is because of the justification of the war against Hitler. That's the reason why, again, bringing together the two world wars makes sense in teaching them in schools as I have. 
is that the, the justification for war in 1939 seems, seems to be clear. But the justification for war in 1914-18 was anything but clear. And in fact, the war that, that emerged was one that was bore no resemblance to the initial conflict. So the claim I want to make is that there are very large groups of young people, the Australians probably are most prominent among them, who have transformed commemoration uh, into what might be described as a global peace effort. And it's, it's really intriguing to see this. Uh, I've seen it in Europe as well, but I do believe that you're perfectly right, that there are different memory regimes. And one of them is in Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe, they're beginning to commemorate the wars of liberation after 1918 in Poland, for instance. There's going to be a museum of the Great Patriotic War of 1918-21, which, which they won. They, they threw the Soviet army off their, off their soil. The notion of 1914-18 as a disaster isn't there because the notion of 1914-18 isn't there. They never had a history of the First World War. They had a history of the Wall Street Revolution in its place. When you turn further uh, afield to the Middle East or deep China where I've been recently, they had no sense of the First World War at all. So what I would claim is that there are different memory regimes in the world. The one that exists in the West, in inverted commas, has now opened a possibility of using the First World War as an icon of everything that the European Union, whatever mess uh, that it may be, it's certainly better than the story that I've just described. Uh, and it is that politics, the politics of a, of, of a block in the world which basically has no army and has no capacity to use force. Individual nations do, the European Union doesn't. It has no force. This force is entirely economic insofar as it has it. So uh, my claim is that the people are there, young people are doing this without my having to tell them or anyone else plotting it. And that the reasons for it are that it's a certain kind of memory of catastrophe as the counterpoint, as for the, the null set, that which we have turned away from after 1945 is driving it. Uh, and the more I see of it, the more I'm hopeful. Uh, there's a, a transmission of, of memory which is much more to do with the current world order and its miseries uh, than necessarily to do with nationalism. I might add that that's the reason, the reason why we made Cambridge History the First World War, you know, I'm the editor-in-chief, uh, the head of a you know, the concert master, and there are many wonderful musicians in that orchestra that produced it, but there's not a single chapter on the nation. It's entirely transnational. There's no chapter on Canada, there's no chapter on Germany. There's no, there's, there is a chapter on North America, there is a chapter indeed on Africa, on Asia, on Latin America, the things that have never been done before in um, uh, large histories of the war. So we have tried in the historian Island and other places to construct a transnational history of the worst war the world has seen today. And maybe that's one way uh, to teach it. it it's, it's not possible to teach the great war national terms anymore. It's very, very difficult to understand the, the, you know, your point, the, the point of your series, uh, the turning points, unless we see them in translation. Good evening. My question is, um, would you say that disillusionment with war was more of a post-war phenomenon and that it was actually uh, influenced more by the memory of the war than by actual experience? That's a good question. Um, I'm not sure I would be so bold as you are in distinguishing between memory and experience. Uh, I think every one of the experiences we have is uh, mediated through memory. Uh, and I certainly know that several of the experiences that I'm sure I went through never happened. Uh, because my memory has transmuted them. This is certainly true for the soldiers. Everybody knows how, how, this, is, how this is so. Uh, but the, the, there are two separate issues here. The first is the turn against war that happened in the interwar years is something we've forgotten because it made it impossible to, to, to sustain. But there's a brilliant French play uh, by Jean Giraudoux called uh, uh, La Guerre de Trois n'aura pas lieu, the Trojan War never took place, won't take place. Um, translate, imagine this for a translation in English. The Trojan War won't take place. It appears in English under Tiger at the Gates. Uh, talk about memory and experience. But the, the important point about it is it, it, it's entirely pacifist, entirely a turn away from war. George Bush was a French soldier in Gallipoli. The turn away from war that made George Bush and Tony Blair squirm a bit and be inventive with the truth 
Uh, I think that happened uh, in Vietnam. I think it, ha it, had, it had a direct outcome of the American humiliation uh, in, in, se in se sequence after the French humiliation uh, in, in Vietnam. And that was one that could not be really sustained. It was partly buoyed up by 9-11, but even that went. So that the, the polls that indicated that Obama could not get a vote from Congress to support a, a punitive raid on Syria for using sarin gas seems to me to indicate a delegitimation of war uh, in, in political terms, moral terms of something else. It strikes me as something that we should really take note of. So some people say that the slaughter of the No, I, I wouldn't, because you see, the, the, uh, the new weapons uh, were, uh, were ultimately successful. The, the reason why the Allies won the war is that they finally got counter battery fire right. It was an artillery war. And of course, it was artillery in the war well before that. Every time there was an advance, and the artillery laid down a barrage for the infantry to go forward, there were counter battery positions 10 miles away, 20 miles away on the other side of the hill, which could immediately turn the field of the vast into a killing field right away. And that's really what happened. It's not the machine guns that did it, although at the first moment of the battle was something that's true. But the reason why the, 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 the ideas of the generals of a breakthrough failed is that they didn't get counter-battery counter operations uh, right. It took the development of air power for that. Air power was an arm of the artillery. It didn't have an independent uh, existence. And once air power and trigonometry and you know, figuring out where the flashes were of artillery operated in such a way in 1980, finally the Allies got their act together to suppress the counter battery fire that had been so murderous. So this is, you know, artillery war is not new. What is new is the uh, uh, coordination of service arms in order to make it effective. And by then, only by then, the old idea of a breakthrough was, was uh, uh, superseded by the idea of bite and hold. Literally, you move forward slowly and successfully, but not by breaking the lines. So Napoleon died finally in 1918. The idea of a breakthrough battle was sustained until virtually the end. In the last 100 days of 1918, finally they got their together. But it took time to learn how to do that. So old ideas, yes, great for the best, that was a mistake. New weapons, I'm not so sure. It was the coordination of the weapons they had, which made a difference. Yes. Commemoration of war. I find that really, really sad. That you commemorate killing people doing whatever you have to do. I'm not talking you just to, but killing people in the name of peace is, I find, very, very strange. Because right now it's, oh, we're doing this for peaceful <coughs> reasons. How can you say that killing people is peaceful. I didn't say that. No, I didn't say you said that. <laughs> I'm saying that the government says. Well, I'm, I'm trying to make a, a case, as I said, I thought it would be more daring than perhaps it was, uh, that there's something happened to the politics of warfare to make it almost impossible to do in democratic countries. In other countries, of course, it's not another matter in the Middle East and so on. But the, the concept of waging war has many of the ideas that you just expressed in it among a broad section of the population. And it, if it is the case that commemorating the First World War is commemorating the end of that, goodbye to all that, that you just described, then, it is, then it's a moment, I think, to pause and take note of. If, if war ultimately turns into an illegitimate act because of 1914-18 and not because of the war against Hitler, then I'll celebrate it. I won't celebrate war, but I'll celebrate the turn away from it. And my claim was there's something of that kind that has come out of the commemorative movement that I call the memory movement of the 20th century. It's, 
I maybe to uh, I'll put it this way. I'm still hesitant. I'm uncertain, but I'm hopeful that commemoration has a political consequence to it, which is to make war undoable. I hope so. <laughs> The second one is a child of the first. Um, can you make reference to that and perhaps there would be nothing and so on and so forth? But I would be dismissive, but uh, just to get to my point, um, the second war was initiated by Hitler. And um, as I was, there are those who would say that um, Hitler would have never come to power or to the strength that he did had it not been the uh, punitive provisions of the treaty he signed. Can you offer a comment on that? Yes, I can. I think, I think the Treaty of Versailles was a disaster. I, I don't agree with some of the recent scholarship uh, uh, about it. Uh, it was something that rearranged the explosive material that had been created in 1914-18 and simply set it off in an even bigger pack in 1939. So the first thing is the idea that only Germany was to blame for the war was humiliating and unjust and almost certainly untrue. Germany was at the heart of the war crisis in 1914, but there are multiple levels of responsibility in which all the major players, all the major players, have an element of, of, uh, of responsibility attached to them. Sir Edward Grey, for example, the least responsible of the Brits. I don't think anyone says that the, the, the Brits planned the war. It's not true. But Edward Grey never said openly, loudly, clearly, in whatever diplomatic or political or journalistic way, the invasion of Belgium will be an act of war. He never said that. It was the truth. It was inevitable. Why? Because Britain and France had engaged in secret military negotiations over the Entente Cordiale that in the event of war, Britain will send an expeditionary force to France. That was a secret agreement. And when the Prime Minister, Asquith and Gray told the cabinet of the secret agreement and its codicils, the cabinet was shocked. The cabinet didn't know, much less parliament. Nobody knew that Britain was committed to go to war for France in 1905. So the, the, and the secretary, the, the foreign secretary, was one of the two people who knew the whole story. He never said it. He never stood up and said to the German uh, ambassador, uh, Lichnowski, tell the Kaiser, tell anybody, tell everybody. The invasion of Belgium will be an act of war, and the entire British Empire will be at war with Germany. He never did. So when he said later on, if only we had had a League of Nations, this is the words he used, where we could have brought this crisis, the whole thing would have been solved without so it. My, my claim is that the Versailles ju judgment that Germany, clause 231, is responsible for the war, and only Germany is responsible for the war, is a great mistake, and was condemned by political figures on all parts of the a German spectrum. It wasn't just Nazis, but it gave an enormous moral strength, as did the continuation of the Allied blockade after the after the armistice. You know, the, the German the, the German population went hungry between November 1918 and June 1919 to stop rearmament. That's basically what the Allies did. But that was clearly a, a war crime. It was waging war against the civilians. There's no doubt about it. That it was an intent to give the bitterness of the war back to the German people. It just so happened to be a war crime. Uh, and all those things created, as it were, what shall I call it, a cloud of false legitimacy for the Nazi movement to restore the honor of the German nation. Certainly, <coughs> was, a, was a, a devastating a blow to the possibility of maintaining peace. Um, I, I, I like none of it, none of it at all. And they, you know, there are defenders of that side. Margaret McMillan has written a very interesting book about this uh, a few years ago, saying you know, they did the best that anyone could do. I think they did the worst thing. Good evening. Do you think Turkey will ever accept responsibility for the Armenian Genocide? Do you see that happening in the near future or ever? Mm -hmm. That's a good one. I'll tell you a story very briefly. Uh, three years ago, I went to, uh, I went to Turkey to uh, give a lecture, and um, I wanted to give it on the Armenian Genocide. I was asked, please don't do it. So instead, what I did was to give a lecture entitled The Social Construction of Silence. And when I did that, student after student at the end of the lecture said that was the best lecture on the Armenian Genocide I ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows what nobody says. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those, 
you know, lawyers are trained in order to create words that create different meanings for the same things. Uh, they have to do it. I don't think there's, there's any choice in the matter. But slowly but surely, the Turkish regime will see that joining Europe is inevitable, and that the price they have to pay for that is to recognize that another regime in another century engaged in a crime, which, by the way, Adichard saw as a crime at the time. The, the reason why they don't do it is because they believe that the crime has been uh, used by the by the Western powers to literally divide Turkey, Turkey, to threaten the territorial integrity of Turkey itself. This is the story of the birth of the Turkish nation. But they need another story. And as I say, I think there are people now working on it. My guess is that by 1918, by 2018, uh, they will find some formula uh, which will be good enough uh, to say that they recognize that what happened to the Armenian people under the fog of war uh, was uh, the destruction of the Armenian nation. They won't use the word genocide because they believe they're not Nazis. Right? There shouldn't be an equivalent to the Nazis. But they'll use a form of words that will enable them to go back to the negotiations that have to come. I mean, the idea that Istanbul is not a European city is completely crazy. It's like St. Petersburg not being a European city. There's no sense of that at all. They'll find it. I'm hopeful. Perhaps in my old age, I'm getting to be a little benign. Uh, but my view of Turkey, I've been there a few times now, is that there are real movements. Yes, tensions, and yes, obstacles, but real movements. Do you think that revelations that we've seen like from, uh, from, like from people like Bradley Manning, or WikiLeaks, and uh, Edward Snowden, and all that, have, will have any effect towards exposing uh, I guess the fraud of war or the fraud of justified war and further to cause peace, or do you think that people just pick up desensitized to that and turn away? Do you think that, has, that those kind of things have any effect on the, on the horror of war and what war actually is? My guess, is, and it's as good as yours, no better at all, um, is that the long term shift that I described is a, a turn away from war, a delegitimation. Uh, that long-term shift has uh, started for totally different reasons, embedded in the family histories of, of people you know, who saw the 1914 conflict as a, as a catastrophe. And then the war against Hitler in some way re-legitimated war after its delegitimation. It took the, you know, the ending of the Cold War for us to go back to an idea that Europe must be defined in some other way. And my guess is that the ways in which the exposure of the normal diplomatic language of lying and bullying and so on uh, has, uh, has worked uh, is on, on, the, on, the, on the surface. Uh, and that the fundamental issues, the fundamental issues of, uh, of war and peace are now that police actions for short periods of time probably can be sustained uh, in the court of public opinion. But war is no longer a legitimate way of doing business. And that, that is what 1918 is supposed to be. Uh, we've waited a century, and if that is indeed the outcome of the, uh, the commemoration of the millennium, that's uh, about a thousand years from now, it will be too long. But if it's now, if it's in the next few years that we can suddenly recognize how deep a movement there has been away from the war, then I think in a way the same, the same position as we define it, seeing war as a senseless waste of human life, uh, maybe that will become a position that most countries in our part of the world can exist. I think that's a really good note to end the evening on. And I'd uh, just like you to join me in thanking Jay and Jay.